Disruptors and curious minds, welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper, where we get to talk to the people building the new version of the world. And we also get to talk with people who are grounded in the roots of who we are as humans and as a culture and try to apply some of those things as the new version of the world is created. My name's Jeremy. This is Mark over here. And we are here to have a fun discussion about uh, technology from the perspective of, yes, it does good things for us, but it also can pull us further away from our humanity. So, Mark, yeah. uh, any any initial thoughts before we jump in with our uh, with our guest, Dr. Larry Rosen? Um, well, it's fun conversations, but this one might not be so fun. This might be a warning. This might be a, a guidance for how technology can sometimes lead our brains astray. Um, I'm a dopamine junkie. I've been fascinated by it for a while. A uh, couple of books which I'm looking forward to adding our guest book to this on how dopamine and technology affect me. I've done some digital detoxes in my time to try to to get control over my brain. Like, is it a runaway mind train? Like once it's left, like how do I get it back? How do I rein in my use of technology to keep my brain healthy? Um, because the more, I don't know about you, but the more we talk about this technology, the more optimistic I am about it but there's always something you know at the back of my mind saying but can you have too much of a good thing can can it be detrimental to our brain health and you're a parent a lot of our listeners are parents and we see this through the lens of our kids as well it's ramping up so that's how I'm coming to this conversation I'm excited amazing yeah me too and before we introduce our our guests we want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor ripple w-r-i-p-p-l-e Ripple is marketing's on-demand talent platform. If you need to flex out, you have a project, but you don't have uh, the budget for full-time headcount, you can lean on these uh, individuals who uh, are great at stacking interdisciplinary teams and pointing them to projects, whether they're a month long or a year long. They're fantastic. 3,000 vetted specialists in their arena. And uh, Mark and I are actually in there as well. So uh, should you need our assistance? Without further ado, I want to bring on uh, our guest, Dr. Larry Rosen. I, I ran across his work a long time ago. He's got a book, uh, a few, I think a few books, but one of the books is Eye Disorder, which um, which is a very interesting title. He's been on 60 Minutes. He's been on Today's Show. Everyone, everyone's been interviewing him about the power of technology and what it, what it does to our brain in good ways and bad ways. So without further ado, we'd like to welcome Dr. Larry Rosen to Thinking on Paper. Larry, how are you, sir? Hi, hey, good morning. Great. Good morning. Great. Great to be on. Thanks. Thank you. Awesome. Well, let's, dismal, yeah. Dismal oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Outside. It's a dismal morning outside in San Diego. A little overcast here, as you can see. Looks a little foggy. Looks a little foggy. Yes. Speaking of fog, speaking of brain fog, um, we, we talked about, Mark, Mark hinted on this, this, this thing called dopamine that we've all heard about, but there's another kind of equal and opposite of dopamine dare we say called cortisol so like what is what does cortisol and dopamine do uh while we're engaging with technology let's just let's just keep it simple and say you know i'm checking social media on my phone what do those two chemicals in our brain do when we're cycling through something like that so if you're if you're checking social media um, let's let's make a situation out of it. Suppose you're checking social media because you really love it and it, it makes you feel good and you're happy to do it. And so you jump on and your brain starts putting out dopamine because dopamine is the chemical, the kind of feel-good chemical in your brain. One of many, by the way. It's just the little two that people know about in serotonin. Um, so you, So they start leaking those chemicals into your brain and those chemicals then react with the cells in your brain and make you feel good and make you but make you want more because it's a really good feeling and so you want to you want to be on social media more and more and more and more and more uh, or or you can do the same analogous to video games you play a video game for a while you get a shot of dopamine um, the next time you play the video game you want that shot of dopamine again because it's all good and so you play and you need to play a little longer to get the same amount of dopamine um on the other side of the of, of the of brain chemistry is uh, cortisol um and cortisol is again one of many chemicals that have to do with anxiety 
um, and arousal, both positive arousal and negative arousal. But in general, when we talk about cortisol, we talk a lot about kind of negative arousal. So now let's go back to your getting on social media. You get on social media because you haven't been on for a while. And a little and gland spews out some cortisol. And the more anxious you get, the more your adrenal gland throws out cortisol, more cortisol, more cortisol, more cortisol, more cortisol. And in small quantities, cortisol is a good thing. Wakes you up, gets you up in the morning, um, you know, makes, you, makes you peppy, it gets you out of bad situations. But in large quantities, cortisol is not good for you. It's just not. It makes your, your fingers sweat, uh, the pits sweat, um, your heart palpitations. And so you get on social media because you want to get cortisol. If, so, so imagine you feel anxious because you haven't been on social media for a while. Say TikTok. You haven't been on TikTok for a little while. And you didn't want to see if somebody responded to what you posted. And so you got, you go on to get rid of the cortisol. To have your brain so cortisol. Yeah. So if, if I understand correctly, so the cortisol creates this reaction in you and the dopamine almost washes the cortisol away. But what happens if, so analogous to, to drug use, if you, the longer you do drugs, the more you have to do to get the same effect, the same hit. So I've heard um, with social media, you could have that same phenomenon. What happens when you go onto social media and you don't have the likes and you don't have the comments and you don't have the reach that you expected? What happens to the dopamine and his reaction to the cortisol in that? instance see i think really better way to think of the of cortisol and dopamine is that there are two systems because yes they do interact but it's easier to understand for people to understand that there are two separate systems yes it squirts of dopamine to keep you going but also if you're very anxious about what you're doing you can get extra squirts of cortisol to make you to and and so you want to get rid of the cortisol and enhance the dopamine. It's kind of a uh, uh, interactive symbi symbiotic system is the way it works. And so part part of it I mean, is we just experience it on the outside. So we don't we don't know about what the chemicals are doing in our brain, but we experience it on the outside. Let me give you a really good example um, from a study we did: Malpalo, Dr. Nancy Cheater. Um, brought people into our lab and she would sit somebody down at a, at a computer and say, um, well, what we're going to do is show you the video and um, you'll be asked some questions afterwards. And then she put two little clips on the thing. One measured heart rate and one ma measured um, GSR, galvanic skin response, which is arousal. Again, arousal can be good or bad, but in general, this kind of arousal is not good. So what she did then is she starts the video and she says, just put your phone next to you for now. Don't worry about it. You don't need it. And then in about a minute, she says, so wait, stop, 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 stop. Your, your phone right here next to you is interfering with the things on your fingers. So I'm going to take your phone and just put it behind me a um, couple feet. And then she starts the video up again. And then she texts them from their phone to their phone, from her phone to their phone, she texts them. And every time she texts them, the GSR goes, <laughs> spikes. Why does it spike? And because cortisol, because they're anxious. They just heard that they got it. And so that makes them very anxious and makes more cortisol. And cortisol makes more cortisol, cortisol. And, and we've done, she did this in, in a study with, um, people who are very heavy smartphone users and sort of more light smartphone users. And sure enough, the heavy smartphone users showed more of those cortisol spikes, the anxious anxiety spikes. I, I, I have felt this. And so hands in the air, I'm not always the best parent. So sometimes when I'm with my kids, my phone is nearby and it's, and it's on vibrate and suddenly there'll be a vibration that comes. And I can feel sometimes that signal that oh, you yeah. speak of like, like it's my, it's visceral like, ah what what ah and i like i have to fight the urge to okay i'm not going to go and look at what that message i don't need to know it's not going to change my life but like the pull is so strong sometimes 
Yeah, Jeremy was mentioning, and I guess there was some in the in the intro that that I'd been on on sixty minutes. Um, and it's, it's there's a link I'm seeing for people to look at it. There's a link on my website, um, drlayerrosen.com. Um, but and when Anderson Cooper interviewed me, um, we just sit, you know, you sit in a chair across from him, and he's asking me questions, and he put his phone down by the, on the floor next to him, and at one point he goes, Larry, he said. I have to tell you, I didn't understand a thing you just said because my phone's right down there and I'm anxious. Well, I need to check. And it was like perfect, perfect response because that's what happens to us. We get anxious if we don't check in often enough. So we check in more and more often. <clears throat> and and I've collected data on people on, on how they use technology, what apps they use more, how much time they spend. What's most interesting is what happens with notifications. They get they want to get notified by everything, and so they get like a day, and every one of those notifications is is like a text message. It spikes that cortisol, and so you can imagine your body is going through this constant battle between it wants to do stuff it likes, so it can get dopamine and feel good, but unfortunately, it's anxious about stuff that it's not keeping up on and so cortisol is in there just just it's kind of chemical slush in your brain pulling you in all those directions i i've got a i've got a theory on this larry that, that i would love your thoughts um culturally i think we are um we're obsessed with with what i call the business of busy and it came came about through some research i read by a, an author and um computer scientist named uh, cal newport talks about deep work a lot right like really staying sure. focused on a deep project and and we have a a, a mechanic uh, a measure of our pro productivity these days that is akin to how we measured productivity when we were in factories right and the productivity of a factory is like how much stuff it does right not, not, you know, Hey, what, what are the big things you're doing about how much stuff at the volume of things? Right. So as workers now, you know, if we are working for a company and you're not on Slack and you're not, you know, uh, you know, on teams and email and you don't respond within 30 seconds to something, your boss might think you're, you know, screwing off somewhere. How, how do you think that influences this, you know, anxiety or this need to check in? Is that, is that anywhere on point? Do you think? Absolutely. And, and in fact, Interestingly enough, um, some companies early on were for this, and and I think um, the one I remember, BMW, I think, responded, and I think Deutsche Bank also. And the way they responded to what you're describing is they created a seven seven rule that they could the company and people in the company can email you or Slack you or whatever between seven a.m. and seven p.m. and you're responsible for responding. Before 7 a.m., not responsible. After 7 p.m., not responsible. And what they found is that it made people much more productive because they didn't have to then before 7, like in, you know, wake up in the middle of the night with all these ideas teeming in their heads. Oh, my God, I got to check my email. I got to check this. There isn't that, that kind of absolved of that responsibility. I don't know if they still do it, by the way, but I think, again, what you're describing is that we have been sucked into this world where we feel as though we have to be 24-7-365. And that's just not healthy. But there's also, an, there's also an energy discussion there too, right? Because we only have a certain amount of energy that we we can deliver every, or use every day. The tank is, it is what it is, right? And it's not just time, but it's time plus energy. And all of these notifications, go, 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 we're, we're that takes up energy, doesn't it? Is there Absolutely. any way of measuring how much energy? Like if you wanted to know kind of as a, imagine you have a bucket of energy one day, 100%. How, how much would one notification take out of your bucket of 100% energy? Do, is there any way of knowing that? I know it's different depending on person to person. but Yeah, I in way of knowing that, but I do see that people are starting to um to try to hone in on that that kind of a, of of a, a measurement tool uh, there's one group that's doing it very differently it's called the ABCD project um, it's across the world it's multiple universities and they started with 
10 year olds and they've got a bunch of 10 year olds, thousands, 10 year olds, and they gave them surveys, um, you know, how much they use technology and stuff like that. And their parents surveys and stuff like that. And then they scanned their brains. And then every year they brought them back. They're bringing them back in right in the year four or maybe five of this project. But every year they bring them back in and they scan their brains again. And what they find, what they finding is that those who initially who are more technology are showing a, an early thinning of their cortex. Now, our cortex thins naturally as we as we as we develop, but these kids are in this ab thinning of the cortex, and the idea is just that perhaps it's making them older than their age. If that makes any sense? Mm. It's yeah. brain. They have the brain of a, of an older person, of an older kid, probably older teenager, but they have the body of ten year old or eleven year old, um, and and they can't deal with that. And so, can we measure that? I suspect we will be able to with tools like like MRIs and CAT scan. But we will be able to do that um, at some point. But there's lots of research now with it, whether you um, what they call swabs, and they have you, they give you a, um, like a Q-tip and put it in your mouth, swab saliva, stick it in the bottle, and then what they can do is they can measure the amount of cortisol. They can tell how much cortisol and and other chemicals stay here in your system. So at some point, right, um, Mark, I think that's tool, but we will be able to kind of get a, a a number of how much energy it takes to do all these things. We're getting closer. What's, what's the what's the role of, of the cortex? You said that the cortex naturally thins into your teenage years. So this is something that happens during adolescence. What what function does that serve, and what's the impact of that happening at an at ten as opposed to sixteen, seventeen, or eighteen? So what the cortex does is it's it's the first line of attack. It, it includes the sensory neural system and includes the auditory system and smell and all those, all those sensory systems. And it's responsible for routing information in your brain to your prefrontal cortex up here. So stuff comes in all over the part of your brain, you know, through your eyes, your nose, your mouth, whatever comes in, it comes in the cortex, it goes to your prefrontal cortex, which is responsible for attention. Uh, multitasking, workload, uh, it, it's it's really your controller. Um, and then it, your prefrontal cortex, is now responsible for putting stuff back into your brain, but not in the cortex, down into your brain and accessing the areas in your brain like the hippocampus. Um, each one of those areas gets access. So if you have a, a prefrontal, I mean, if you have a thinning, early thinning of your cortex, my guess is Sorry, my dog just jumped up to sit next to me. <laughs> he probably wants to hear one. Oh, hang on. Um, so what happens is the prefrontal cortex itself. Okay, let me back up. You are When you are born, you have neurons in your whole brain, body, everything. As you age, each of those neurons, when you start, each of those neurons is like a live wire. It's just like, a, like, like if you took a, the wire from a lamp and stripped off that rubber stuff on the outside of the wire, that's what each neuron is. Each neuron then gets wrapped with these little cells called myelin, and they're just fatty cells. But what they do is, if you, if you think of this as a, as a wire, they wrap on the wire, so the transmission from here to here can be affected without a problem. But that isn't completed until you're in your late 20s, early 30s at best. And this is the last place to be completed, your prefrontal cortex. So this is why teenagers make bad decisions. Um, and this is why we also explains why you young people can't keep their hands off of social media. They have to be on there. They can't keep their hands off their phones. So it's, you know, as we're talking, we're talking really very complex biochemistry in here of what's going on in your, in your brain and structural stuff in your brain, but it really makes a lot of sense. I see adults, like, so that's there's some crossover there with adults who you have to keep reaching for your phone. You have to have something in there. So that a link between those two things. Go for it, Jeremy. I can see your brain 
exploding. Yeah, my my uh, yeah, all, all those things that Larry was talking about are firing right now. No, it's 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 interesting. The the energy equation is really interesting to me, right? With getting bombarded and how much energy you have left, and less energy you have left, the 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 worse you react to things, or or the you know you don't react the best way to things, right? Um, but there's also a problem and a challenge of like being okay with a little bit of space. Um, as humans, right? We used to you know, go for a walk in the woods or whatever, but now it's like, if we have a minute and I'm guilty of this too, if I'm sitting, you know, waiting to get my oil change or something, I'm not just sitting there looking at the sky. What do I do? I grab my phone. Why? Nothing is so important on that thing that can't wait five minutes. Right. But there is that there's a conditioning, right? Is it, can we describe it as a conditioning that, you know, I'm reaching for this thing all the time? Well, if, if condition means you do an act, and if the act is reinforced, if the act gets a good consequence, then it's reinforced to do it again. So yes, that's exactly right. This is what's happening. We have conditioned our brains to want what's in that phone. Because quite honestly, every time in, when we started doing this, every time we grabbed the phone, there was something interesting, right? I mean, you can always find something interesting on your phone to do. Um, and the more interesting, then the better the shot of dopamine or do it again the next time. So yes, that's exactly right. So here's what here's what I'm here's what I'm looking to I'm looking to break this cycle, uh, Larry. If you can maybe, I, I'm sure that it's not just me that has this cycle, right? How do we uncondition our brain? Right. So here's here's the loop. Let me let me describe the loop. Right. So I'll pick up my phone and I'll go to Instagram. I'll be on Instagram for a few minutes and then I'll immediately cycle. It's like an algorithm. I'll immediately go to LinkedIn. What's going on LinkedIn? Then I'll immediately go to Twitter and see what's going on. And before I know it, it's 20 minutes of like nonsense. And I'm like, wow, now I need 20 minutes to reset myself into whatever I was doing. So how do you, I know what's happening. How can we break the loop? What can we do? Okay. So the answer is not to just get rid of your phone. The answer is not to go cold turkey, put your phone in a drawer for a day. That's just not going to work because you're going to come out of it go, oh my God, I wonder what went on with Instagram and LinkedIn and all that stuff. And then you're just going to go crazy and and a lot of cortisol and GABA and other chemicals are going to make you very anxious. So one of the things that I've worked on trying to teach people is how to pay attention. Because if we back it down, we're re- it's really an issue of where we put our attention. We only have a certain amount of attentional resources, as we were talking about earlier. We only have a certain amount of attentional resources. And we get to pick where to put them. Right now, I think we're not picking. The phone is picking where it's making this flipping. So what I've been teaching people is to kind of reverse their way of thinking. What you want to do is you want to do activities that have nothing to do with the phone. But the phone keeps interrupting those activities. So I've been teaching people what I call tech breaks. And they're very simple. Um, Imagine that you would like to um, increase your attention. And you are working on your laptop and typing and writing things or whatever you're doing or, or hanging out with your kids or whatever. Um, so what I recommend is that you take the phone and you look at it for one minute, look at anything you want on your phone for one minute, and then close all the apps, put them away, close all the apps on your phone, set, put it on silent, set the timer for 15 minutes, turn it upside down and put it right in front of you. Why do you put it in front of you? Because it's going to signal your brain <laughs> don't, start, don't start spewing cortisol here, dude, because because in 15 minutes or less, or whatever I said it for, 15 minutes or less, you're going to get to look. So it's kind of like this little... That sounds little, like torture. Well, it is torture in the beginning because all of our research shows that we, that if we try to focus even for 15 minutes, at best we get about 10 minutes of focus and five minutes of distraction. So I'm trying to help people get 15 minutes of focus. And then when, the, when it rings at 15 minutes, Pick it up, set it for a minute, look at whatever you want, silence it, 15 more minutes upside down. And just keep doing it until one time it'll ring and you go, wait, 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 wait. I I, I need to keep doing what I'm doing for a second. Ah, now you can take it from 15 minutes to maybe 20, 25, 30. Well, I always encourage people, I think if you can get focus and attention for 30 minutes, then go ahead before the 30 minutes and five minutes after if you really want to end up kind of reinforcing that success give yourself a little bit more tech time but timing 
You also have to, by the way, tell everybody you're doing this because during the 15 minutes, they're going to be texting you like crazy going, where are you? Where are you? Come on. What's why are this you doing? What's are you this doing to our texts? What's this doing to the brain? Because it sounds a bit like an adult version of the marshmallow test where we're strengthening executive functions or something like we're, like what's happening in the brain in this, if we, when we do this? Well, okay. So one thing that's not happening is cortisol is not leaking in there because you know, you're going to get to it within a, a set period of time. But what is happening is your, your brain is focusing more up here in the prefrontal cortex. It's more active. Um, it's more, it's, it's more, um, distinct in some sense. And what I mean by distinct is when, when you look at the prefrontal cortex, it's good activity, then you see a lot of focus in kind of this area on this area. These are the attention and working areas of the prefrontal cortex. And you don't see a lot in the middle, which is your multitasking area. Uh, so what it does is it focuses the neur the way the neurons in your brain work and it makes you more effective. I think that it, yeah, the interesting thing here, I think, is we, we, there, there's, there's a $10 billion industry. I don't even know if that number's right. There's something <laughs> $10 billion industry for, you know, for health, like for, for health and fitness, right? So we go to the gym, we go in and do these things for 30 minutes in the gym and we get stronger, we get faster, we get more healthy and all of that. But like no one thinks about applying these things, these same principles to getting better in certain mental capacities and, and getting better in a mental capacity to me is, you know, sharpening my attention, right? Being able to be present and, you know, meditation is great for this and that too. Um, but I think that test is really interesting because it doesn't, uh, it doesn't allow that cortisol to leak in. And I think that is the first part that you're trying to solve, right? Right. And the idea is you're trying to build up the amount of time that, you, that you're not anxious and that you're focused. So that what, and it doesn't matter what you're focused on. I mean, I recommend people do tech breaks during dinner with their family and kids, right? You sit at the dinner table, everybody's got their phone out looking at their phone. No, no, let's do a tech break during dinner. Let's everybody look at their phone for a minute, put it upside, turn it, turn it off, put it upside down. And now let's have 15 minutes of family talk. Oh, wait, the alarm went off 15 minutes. Hey, everybody, you can get a tech break for a minute here. Kids are happy. Parents are happy. One minute's more than enough time, by the way. People go, oh, that's, you can't do much in one minute. No, one minute, you can check TikTok, Instagram, yeah. LinkedIn. You can check them all in, within one minute without a problem. And so what it, everybody wins. Um, and it, it seems so simple and not um, works. You're training people, literally you're training your brain to not get anxious. It's another thing they should be teaching at school, Jeremy. They should be, that they sh rather than taking people's phones from them at school, they should be That's teaching these skills, these shortcuts to better focus and like helping us live with these devices, not kind of alienating the devices during the school time. So when they go home, they're just like, Arr. well, uh, we're seeing like when, we walk down the, when they walk down the hall between classes, kids in high school, They've got their faces and their phones. The they do that on the road. They're on the road doing that. Yeah. You so what? If you, you're right, if you could do this in school, because school these, these days, school well, they just take the phones away. Yeah, it's, that's the easiest thing. That's not. That's not going to work because every new record is all leaking. And how much attention can you pay? If you're anxious about what's going on on TikTok. So they do this thing in my in our school. I think they call it the beep test. It's like a physical education thing where there are two cones, and then you know every time it beeps, you got to start running. You know, see how many times you can run between the cones, and you get rest, and it beeps again. We that's need another to, type of torture, right? That's that's great. But we also, I mean, we need to do a beep test for for the phone. So let's put that on the thinking on paper, change the world uh, whiteboard list. Um, you mentioned a, a word, Larry, that that. I've been tracking for a lot of years and thinking deeply about for a lot of years as a, as a drummer, as a former bartender <laughs> perspective, why do humans think they're so good at multitasking? Oh my goodness. Because, um, they can walk and chew gum. That's, that's easy. Um, that's right. But what they don't realize is that, that even though they think they're multitasking, um, and they think they're effective multitaskers. Every single test shows that you can't do it. 
I, I, let me take that back. There's two, it, two percent of the population are what are called super taskers. They can multitask, but that's only two out of every hundred people. The other night, they can't multitask. And you can prove this to you. And they turn on the television on, on say, CNN. And, you know, they have the little scroll at the bottom. And then they have the person at the top talking. Try to, try to focus on both of them at the same time. You can't do it. You simply can't do it. And yet we think we can. And the reason we think we can, by the way, is because if it's an easy task, like walking, then we can do anything else. Like I can walk with a friend and talk to them and not fall all over my face because walking is automatic. Talking to my friend is not automatic. It's using my brain, obviously, and memory and tension and all that. Um, and so the best thing we can do is to recognize that if you're going to be the most effective and the tasks require you brain, while and then take a break into another one for a while doesn't mean you have to finish them it's just you want a unitask don't want to multitask because you're going to make mistakes well the, and a lot of a lot of this you know with with ai and you know the you know computing and all of this stuff like when you when you think about the difference between people and 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 machines machines are parallel processors right meaning they can handle multiple tasks or it you know, machines can handle multiple tasks what the human brain cannot parallel process, correct? Um, that's not altogether true. We can, we are always parallel process. Our brains are parallel process in machines. The problem is is that that when you're doing two tasks, you can visualize it in your brain as this: that in your brain, your neurons need oxygen and glucose. Those two substances help n make neurons activate. So imagine that you're thinking about something. And so over here, we have a little, pretend we have a little air brain and we can take a, a visual picture of it and we'll see a lot of activity because the blood is rushing to those areas, positing glucose and oxygen and those waking those neurons up, getting them working. Now, suppose you start thinking about something else like LinkedIn over here. Again, it's not a simple, but then all the blood is going to rush from here over to here so that it can deposit oxygen and glucose. What happens over here, though, is that the amount of blood there is less and less, and it kind of fades away. So now if you want to go back and think about this side, what you are doing before you flipped over to LinkedIn, you have to re-energize the whole process. It's like you have wow. to start all over and re-up the process of getting glucose and oxygen to these neurons to get them sparked up so they'll start working. Think what a great it. visualization. So I'm looking at this water bottle, right? And you know, all the blood is on this side because your brain's thinking about this idea and then it switches to that side. And just like uh, that, seeing it that way is, is really interesting to think about that. Yeah. Maybe two things can go on at the same time, but are they getting the resources to be powered in the way they were intended? Right. Right. Yeah. Now imagine in the brain, you need more resources, the more complicated you think path is. I mean, if I, if I'm just going off, I, I don't need much of my neurons just down here in the brainstem to get me to walk. So I got blood to go elsewhere and oxygen and glucose to go elsewhere and do all, all sorts of other things. Trying to get this and this going at the same time, there's just not enough blood in our brains to be able to do that. And again, it's an analogy. It's not the way it works. If you, if you want to look, send people to something called the glass brain, it's it's on my co-author Adam Ghazali, who wrote the distracted mind with me, um, developed this where you can actually see um, a, an image like you're looking into somebody's brain through the, like those glass around here, and you can mm. hear in there, and you can see how it's active all the time. I mean, there's just stuff going on. These neurons are going all the time, all the time. Our brain is constantly working, and the idea is to make it work at a, at an optimal rate. And trying to do two tasks at the same time is suboptimal. So now, now that we've... Oh, go ahead, Mark. Well, I was, I was just going to say, um, we focused a lot on our phones, notifications. What's the research or what have you come across? What's the research saying about gaming and virtual reality? Because like, this is about 
technology, not just our phones, not just that part of it. So what about this, these new technologies? How, how are people's brains working when they spend eight hours in a computer game compared to eight hours in an office, for example? And how, how is the, the, the research looking at virtual reality and augmented reality and how the brain is going to be affected by that? Okay, so I, I will tell you that there's a ton of research on gaming and very little on augmented reality or virtual reality. Um, but again, if we go back to the model of dopamine and we pull the, the idea of this dopamine molecule, when we game, we get pleasure, right? I mean, if, if, why play a game if it's not pleasurable? So imagine you're playing a game and you get pleasure. Crypto. And then this dopamine starts get, getting in your brain. If you have dopamine, you feel pretty good. But then you put the game down and the next day you come back and you start playing, but you need to play more to get more dopamine and you need to play longer to get more dopamine. And my gut says is that all of this, I mean, in all the research we've seen on gaming shows this is why your brain, this is why you get sucked in and get addicted to gaming is because you need more to get the same amount of dopamine. Well, it's as simple as that. And so virtual reality would be, I would think it'd be even stronger that you could even get cooked in faster um, because it's pretty, it can be pretty exciting. One by the, I get, I get dizzy and sick. And it's like, oh, you know, any of those virtual reality glasses and stuff, I can't, I can't handle, but I can see how people who put them on just get, just, it's like, it's just exciting feels good and the feel good is the dopamine it's what makes it feel good all right so we so we talked about phones talked briefly about you know xr and gaming and that sort of thing so when when these devices are are external to us we do have the ability to flip them over put them down and, and set a timer but we all have heard about this you know kind of man machine interface you know, being tested, you know, Neuralace or Neuralink or whatever the heck it is. Um, like what, what are we, what are we in for? Cause we, we, we don't have a handle on this yet. Like we don't have a handle on how to manage this yet. What about when it becomes a part of us? Well, wow. <laughs> Great question. That is a, a, an excellent question and a very scary proposition because essentially, um, there are already programs that where people are implanted with computers. Um, my dog has a computer chip in the back of his neck. If he gets away, they scan the back of his neck, right? But people are actually embedding computer chips down here in, in their wrist. And um, there was, there's a, I forget what the what word it was, but I saw a show on this. Where in a whole company, everybody in these things, you walk up to a door to go automatically recognize you and opens <laughs> for you, um, and and this this little thing, the little piece of this thing down below that you put in your wrist, um, basically is a little com mini computer. And my guess is that unless we get a handle on this, and unless we figure out how to to make the the younger generation not feel so crazy about this stuff. And the better off we'll be in the long run. But right now, I think what I see I see in terms of innovations as pendulums. So right now, if we look at this as like a swinging pendulum. Well, the pendulum's going up here towards crazy, right? And I don't think we're there yet. I think we're maybe about here. And the pendulum's got to get all the way up to here before it can swing all the way back to the other side. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're, we're, if you watch kids, which is, I mean, they're, they're going to be the next full-time users of all this in the business world and whatever. If you watch, um, just, I mean, just stand around high school college or whatever, they can't let go of their phones. They're on them all the time. We've studied them. They, 
we know that they're, the average is well over 10 hours a day accessing their phone and that they open it a hundred times, open and close, shut it every three minutes at a hundred times plus a day. Um, something has got to happen to change that, to intervene more. And if we don't do that, what we're going to find is, well, we're already seeing that. I mean, I've, I have grandkids, 10, 11, 12 range, and then very young, the, the, the 11, particularly the 11 year olds have been using technology for their whole life. I mean, at one, I watched one of the one who just had his 11th birthday. I watched him at one year old crawl across the room, find a box that an, an iPhone came in and it had a picture of the iPhone on it and start tapping on the box to do something. That was at one years old. Now at 11, if he can't be on his, on his iPad, his mom blocks his iPad use, he literally has a meltdown. And when I've seen him, he literally get down on his hands and knees and beg his mother, Mom, please, one block me. I just need to finish this one phone. I have to. It's like, <sighs> like, like you forgot it. You add into that the fact that they're doing all this stuff with other people at the same time. My grandchildren, both the 11 year old boys, both, both are always on with other kids gaming. Um, they often watch other people game rather than do it themselves. And so they're really spending a lot of time in this, this sort of world. What's going to happen? Well, I think it's punchline you know, it's getting back here. What's, what's going to happen is we're going to have, I think a generation who don't have eye contact and how to look you in the face because you're on the screen or need to, um, they're not going to be very good at attention at focusing on attention and they're going to have a lot of, I think, anxiety issues um, because really what we're seeing is, is what I would consider, if I were like a, a psychologist coming from another planet and I watched how people reacted to their phones, I'd say, oh, you guys all have OCD. Ah, yeah. Doesn't it? Yeah. Pick up the phone, look at it. Pick up the phone, look at it. Pick up the phone, look at it. That sounds like OCD to me. That's, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, it, it, and I can it, I can attest to the eye contact thing because you know I coach I coach lacrosse at, at various levels, you know, from youth all the way up through high school, and uh, the eye contact thing is seems to be seems to be falling off a little bit. Then you noticing that dramatically? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And you you almost have to say, hey, you have to you have to kind of cue. Not everyone, not everyone's like that, but I notice a. A, a higher tendency now for less eye contact than in the past. Yep. Well, if you spend all your time looking at a screen, it, uh, it's scary to look at somebody's face. Yeah. Wow. This is this is some heavy stuff, guys. Like, it, but but that's it, what but we do on thinking on paper. It's got to get heavy. This is important. Well, well that's is. that's the whole point of this of us talking today is. As you were talking, Jeremy, you were talking earlier about culture. Well, that this is the culture, our our culture now. Is this is the way we we can evolve to this kind of a cultural norm? Um, Ninety plus percent of kids have their own phones. Um, the, the the average age of getting for the first phone has dropped precipitously, and it's now in the 10, 11 year old range. Um, all this oh, just now. ask just ask my ask my daughter. So she's her first year in college. And she didn't get her phone till she was like 16. We were like sticklers about it. And then the son got it earlier. And then the next son got it earlier. And then she's like, see, dad, like, I didn't get mine till I was 16. But, you know, Myers got his at 10 or whatever. Like, um, that's my fault. But uh, that's your fault. Dad. <laughs> that's your, your fault. fault. But you, Part you mentioned, it, you mentioned but evolution. Have and we haven't I evolved. Just... Right. Mark, hold on for one second. I want to respond to Jeremy for a second. Think about why they want the phone at that age. And the answer is because all their friends have it and all their friends are on social media. And if they don't keep checking it on social media, then they're going to be left out. And that's the one thing as a child slash teenager, you do not want to be is left out. That's, that's the core. 
That's the core reason right there because it, it's like a, yeah, it's like an early version of keeping up with the Joneses. Like <laughs> yeah, before you even, you know, have a job and are trying to accumulate stuff. Like that's real. That's a real reason. You And yeah, being left out as a kid is, is, is pretty heavy. Can I yep. add to that though? Because I, I think there's more to that. I think that they want those phones as well. Not be, because of that, but because for 10, 11, 12, 13 years, They've seen me and they've seen you and they've seen their mom and their dad and their uncle and their uncle's friends and their brother and their all their parents' friends and every single place they go, every single interaction they have in the cinema, in the shop, in the restaurant, on the beach, on the motorway, it doesn't matter where it is, people are staring at their phones and they want, that's all they know. So it's, it's yes, it is, they want to be like their friends, but it's also, they're just mimicking what they know. Right, we're bad, bad parenting, I would call it. Bad parenting. Well, bad I don't think it's just pa- role models, isn't it? It goes beyond parents. It goes to society as a whole. Right, and I think I think that part, I agree with you 100% that, that we have modeled, see, us adults, I mean, I, I look at my screen, do you ever look at your screen time on your phone? God, when like, I'm feeling particularly s- sadistic. Yeah, well, it pops up once a week, right? Pops up once a week and says, "This week you're you've increased your screen time fifteen percent." Now, my problem is is that people don't look at that. I always encourage people every week when it pops up on the screen, go look, see where you spent all your time. Do you really want to be doing all that? Do you really want to be op- opening your computer, unlocking your phone a hundred times a day? Do you really want to be doing that? And, and I think that's part of where we have to be as a, as a culture right now is into shaping that behavior. And we're shaping it, like Mark said, we're shaping it in the wrong way. We're shaping it by showing them, well, we do it all the time. Why can't, why can't I? Yeah, I think, I think awareness is like the biggest piece of the puzzle here. And like conversations just like this that open people and create awareness that, you know, hey, Tech and you, for everyone listening to the show has been Mark and I have been at this about a year and a half, and we we love looking forward into the future, and we love the things that that technology can help us do and solve. But there's a real other side to that equation that we all need to be really mindful about. That you know, being aware that you know, twelve hours on your phone every day is is really going to kill you. Like in a lot, of, I mean, I say that kind of like ingest a little bit, but like the anxiety that, that the cortisol, if you just look at it from cortisol and an anxiety level, we talk about we're in an age of anxiety right now, but no one thinks about some of the potential causes of that anxiety, right? Exactly. And I think that's, that's why the, my, my attitude is always read the research and, and have discussions like this where I can give you bits of research so you don't have to digest it yourself, but, but but follow the work, follow follow the research. What is it showing? And then I always tell parents, particularly, if you want your kids to act, model that action. And just like Mark said, we're not we're not being very good role models right now. I mean, it's funny. You walk down the street. I, I'm I, I like to watch people. You walk down the street, and I guarantee you that that within 20 yards, you'll see somebody walking their dog and holding their phone at the same time. What a model. You can't, you can't even take time to, to walk your dog and enjoy the outside. Wait till the dogs rise up and the dogs start playing on their phones. Um, (laughs) Where you, you said, follow the research, Larry, obviously we'll share um, links to your website. If people listening to this or watching this, if you could recommend one piece of research or one book to read or something that they can take this conversation further, where what would you suggest they they do or read or watch? Well, of course, my first my first suggestion would be to, to read my book, The Distracted Mind, because I think that we that Adam and I have set out both from a, a morality point of view and a psychology point of view what can't attend. And I think that the thing to really look at is where are you depositing your attention? And 
if the, the phone can tell you a little bit about that, it can tell you where on your phone where you deposit it and how much time. But I think I, I'm always one of those people who thinks you should deal with data. And what I recommend when I talk is the first thing I would like you to do is to think about your own use of your phone. And every day open springtime, and I want you to write down a piece of paper or on a spreadsheet or whatever. Um, where you spent the most and you do this and how much time you spent doing this and get a sense of how your use of technology is and then think about your kids what do what what's your goal for them where do you want them to be um and i i do a lot of um talks to parents about this and it's difficult quite honestly it's a, it's a very difficult chore because nothing is as interesting as what's on your phone or your ipad television's boring my grandkid <laughs> why because it's boring because there's no other activity and 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 so you just have to kind of kind of get a sense of of how much you're doing it so you can then monitor your kids monitor your friends um, even your parents monitor your parents um in what they're doing i think data data um are, are helpful and then i mean I, quite honestly i mean you know it's like there's lots of blogs out there people you could read i write i write a very infrequent blog um on psychology today but there's lots on psychology today. there's lots of people writing blogs about technology usage and over usage this is great great conversation larry it's such an uh such a fresh perspective uh from what we talk about every day um, or every week on the show. And I think it's an important thing to consider as, you know, as the, as the future on, on a future reveals itself uh, a moment at a time. And, and we kind of see where we're headed and, and, you know, how things are affecting us today and how they could affect us down the road. Um, wonderful conversation, Larry. We really appreciate you, yeah. you joining and uh, Mark will put, um, send us any links, like send us an email of anything that you, that you think of that might be interesting for, our audience to dig in deeper and, and, and check out and we'll share your book and uh, the links, the Anderson Cooper link. I, I thought that was really interesting. I watched that this morning. Um, but yeah, thanks for joining us. And also thanks again to Ripple, W-R-I-P-P-L-E, Marketing's On Demand talent platform. They've been a great supporter of Thinking on Paper over the years. And uh, we um, we appreciate them. Over 3,000 solopreneurs in their disciplines and specialties organized by... Um, great people at ripple if you need interdisciplinary teams so give them a check out and um, mark tell them about the book club before we get out of here well i was going to say maybe we got to choose our next book for the book club jamie i know it's your choice maybe larry's book is the book that we read in our book club um a little bit of a link to today's conversation our book is clear thinking by shane parish where every week we are digging deep into the into the strategies for clearer thinking and much of it is attention and being aware of what you're doing with your brain power so check it out um thinking on paper xyz that's it be curious stay disruptive keep thinking on paper see you next, next week time.